All right, well, uh, the last couple of weeks we went uh, through a lesson uh, from Acts 26 uh, when Paul gave his testimony uh, before Agrippa and Festus. And we, if you'll just remember those points that we brought out, uh, first of all, when we give our testimony, we should have a good attitude about it. Uh, nothing like a long, grumpy face to put somebody else off. But we're trying to win them to ourselves in many ways, um, to win them to the Lord. And then share something of your background. Paul gave a little bit of his history, uh, who was and what his background was. People need to know who you are uh, in order to believe what you're saying. That you know, It has to be authentic. And number three, give a place and time of salvation if you can. And the, the most important part about that is that people understand that salvation is not a process. It's not uh, being good and doing good works, but rather it's something God does for us rather than something we do for him. And so it's, it's an event that takes place like the, the new birth, like, like the first birth. Number four, relate your experience. And so you're basically telling them, you know, the, the, the events that led up to uh, your salvation, how you got saved, where was it, when was it, um, how did it happen, and you're, you're relating that experience. And then ex- explain salvation, and part of the, you know, part of the testimony, uh, somewhere along there, you, you heard the gospel, whether it was a church or whoever it was that was witnessing to you, um, so you can take that opportunity to explain in detail what the gospel is, and then tell them how it changed your life. And one of the things you see in Acts 26 is the contrast. Paul's you know, here he was once persecuting the church, and now he's preaching the gospel, which once he persecuted. And that's the key thing. And the pivot is is that event, the salvation event. And so this is what my life was before I got saved. This is what my life is now, now that I am seeing. And it's really important that we contrast that. Then expect the devil's interruption. When we're given our testimony, many times Satan doesn't like it. There's going to be interruptions. And this is true when you're witnessing. Uh, we kind of expect it to happen. Then appeal to your listener's conscience and bring that message to bear upon them, how it relates to them, and then close on a positive note. Now, some of the uh, well, the testimonies we're going to look at tonight, uh, some of those questions or some of those uh, points won't apply uh, because the testimonies we're going to see tonight, obviously, were done, uh, I guess, in a television studio. Now, they're all Jewish testimonies, okay, because basically... I mean, I search for testimonies, and you get some weird, weird and woolly ones. And these are these are short, from uh, five to nine minutes long. We're going to sh- show three testimonies tonight. Now, does everybody have this little sheet right here? I want to explain that. And you know, if you take, uh, hopefully, you have a pen and you can use your Bible. And I want you to take notes on this, um, if you will. We're going to discuss these testimonies um, after we view them. But if you look at the the sheet there tonight, examples of how to give your testimony, and there's going to be three testimonies. There's little boxes there for you to write in the answers uh, to the questions concerning each one of those testimonies. So question one is, how did the opening remarks capture attention? Now, obviously, this is something that's been done for Internet use and so on. Um, What is a testimony? Usually, who is a testimony for? You know, if you had the opportunity to give your testimony, would it be in here or would it be in a group of 50 people who are unbelievers? I mean, there's no contest, is there? Uh, give me the own, because the testimony is is for unsaved people. And so it's for people who don't understand what we understand. It's for people who don't uh, who are, who are off in different areas. So you'll see in each one of these testimonies tonight, the opening remarks um, should grab your attention. But obviously these people are trying to reach, they are Jewish people who had gotten saved, and they're trying to reach out to other Jewish people. So how would those open remarks, how would that grab the interest of a Jewish person? Okay, we're going to discuss that. Uh, And so you might want to mark down on your your notes there what you might think that that is. Okay, and you see you've got obviously a column for testimony one there. Second question is, did the person display a pleasing attitude? What stood out? What was it that, it, and I think I've watched these three testimonies probably about four or five times each, um, and I enjoyed every time I watched them. Um, and there's something about them that, that should attract you to that person. What is it? Was it their sincerity? Was it their humor? Was it the, just the fact that they seemed reasonable? Uh, what was it that, as an unsaved person, would um, be attractive 
or would get you to listen if you were an unsafe person what would what would help uh what did they say what did they do uh to make that um attractive to you to listen to them number three did the person share their background and who could identify with their background well obviously it's it's a jewish testimony so they were applying to jews but what about your background who could your background appeal to like we're all different okay and there's people that you can give your testimony to that would mean a whole lot more to that person than when i give my testimony then there's people I give my testimony, it may be more meaningful than, than maybe your testimony. And you see, that's it. The Lord has different tools for different different people. And so we'll see how it fits for them. Number four, did they relate their salvation experience? Did they tell you how they got saved? And, you know, I've, I've already filled mine out, by the way. Um, <clears throat> I got a head start. Um, but you might want to just put a word down, or just a couple of words, or a little phrase that they say, just because we're going to come back and we're going to, Talk to you about it and see what you say about it. So, you know, put, put something down. And then, were their stories the same or were they different? Was it all similar or were they different? And did they give a time and a place? Was it an event? Did they mention that? Number five, did they explain salvation? And what aspect of salvation did they emphasize? Did they talk about the substitutionary death of Christ? Or did they major maybe on, on how that happened? Were they accepted Christ by faith? Uh, number six, did the person emphasize contrast? This is really important. Before salvation, after salvation. And how was that change demonstrated? Did they say something in their testimony that demonstrated the change that took place? And really that describes, you know, really the doctrine of repentance. And then number seven, each story involves someone who was a Christian witness. Who was that witness? In each of the testimonies, you should be able to pick it out, write their name down, or, or whoever the person was, describe the person. And then what does that teach us? All right, so we're going to uh, look at the first one. The first one is only, uh, I think the first one's only five minutes. And so let me turn this on. Hopefully this hasn't went to sleep. I mean, I heard about some of these, these guys like John the Baptist. He's a Baptist. I found out later on he's Jewish. St. Paul, Jewish? Yeah, Jewish. St. Peter, how can anybody by the name of St. Peter be Jewish? Guess what? I found out they're all Jewish. You know, I grew up in Philadelphia in a Jewish neighborhood on the other side of the street. That was mostly Gentiles. These poor Gentiles, they would worship a statue. Some of those people had statues in their lawns. At the age of eight years old, I joined the Cub Scouts, which is part of the Boy Scouts. They had a, they have, they still probably have this today, a, a magazine. It's called Boy's Life Magazine. And in that magazine, they had the instructions on how to build a uh, crystal radio. I was so excited. It was it was like I was in heaven with this radio that worked. I would rush home from school and put on the earphones and I was hearing these people talking about Jesus on the short wave. They were like, in the name of Jesus. At the same time, I was preparing for my bar mitzvah and my rabbi told me, never believe in Jesus and never read the New Testament. That's a Gentile book and Jesus is for the Gentiles. I joined the Navy in 1960 and wound up in a, in a drill hall with 400 guys. Now, this is the first time in my life I was ever away from my mother and father. They taught me how to smoke a cigarette. Uh, you know, oh, I was coughing like crazy. They said, real sailors drink whiskey. And that was burning my throat. I did it because I wanted to be a real sailor. I wound up getting drunk every night. Wound up going out with, with women that I shouldn't be doing. Sometime deep down inside of me, I was saying, man, this doesn't feel right. Something's wrong here. This doesn't seem right. You see, when you join the Navy, I don't know if they do this today anymore, but this was back in 1960. We were naked and had our hair shaved. And then we went through the line to get our uniforms and stuff. At the end of the line, they said Catholic, Protestant, or Jewish. So they gave you a Bible. I had my Tanakh. I had my little, my Jewish scriptures. I don't know what you do with the Bible. I thought, you know, it might be like a rabbit's foot, good luck charm, or maybe it'd be like my grandmother's chicken soup. Anytime I was sick, my grandmother said, have some matzo ball soup, have some chicken soup. It'll, I said, will it help? She said, it couldn't hurt, you know? I said, well, I have a Bible. Will it help? Well, it couldn't hurt, you know? Uh, one of the sailors uh, that I was with in the Navy said to me, you're Jewish, right? I said, yeah. Do you have a Bible? I said, sure, I have a Bible. They gave it to me when I joined the Navy. He said, let me see your Bible. And he turned in my Bible to Isaiah chapter 53. He said, here, read this. I read the whole chapter of Isaiah 53. I said, wait a minute. This sounds like those folks across the street. This sounds like the Gentiles. 
This sounds like what? I was hearing on the short wave. They made a mistake. They gave me New Testament. And my rabbi told me, never read the New Testament. You better take this because this is for you. This is not my Bible. So no, no. Look, Hebrew Publishing Company. <gasps> Hebrew Publishing Company. What's, this is crazy. What's Jesus doing in my Bible? He said, well, he's your Messiah. He's my Messiah. I, I, I was shocked. And he said, would you like to read about that in the New Testament? I said, uh, well, I can't read the New Testament because my rabbi told me never read uh, the New Testament. And he looked around over here, and he looked over here, and he says, I'll make a deal with you. If you don't tell your rabbi that you read the New Testament, I won't tell him either. I thought about that for a minute. Okay, but I was scared. I thought lightning was going to strike me. I actually thought I was going to be struck in by lightning. I expected it to be a Gentile book. I expected it to take place in Rome with a bunch of popes talking about Catholic things and statues. What surprised me is how Jewish the New Testament really is. It's the most Jewish book I ever read. The more I, I, I read the scriptures, the more I, I was, was praying, I realized that inside I was not, not clean. Inside. I had all kinds of anger. I was getting drunk every night. I was going with the women. I was smoking three packs of Linfilter Pomo all day, coughing like crazy. I was making pretend like I enjoyed it. I didn't want to make pretend anymore. I didn't want to live that way anymore. Now it's three o'clock in the morning. I'm in the barracks, big barracks. And I had a blanket all the way over and, and the light was shining on the New Testament. And I, I prayed, you know, Baruch Atah Anonai, Allah, Hina Malach, Ayolam. Lord, uh, uh, Jesus, I, I'm here. Uh, um, I want to believe in you, and I went to bed. May 16, 1961, came to faith in, in the Messiah. That's just so important in my life. It's, it's a, a, a moment that totally, completely changed the revolution of my life. Even if I was the very last person on earth, Jesus would still have died for me. And I am confident that when I die, I'll go to be with him. It's good, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so let's look at our sheet. First testimony. How did the opening remarks capture attention? So he says, he starts naming like the apostles and uh, uh, John the Baptist. He was a Baptist, right? Well, he was Jewish and Paul was Jewish and Peter was Jewish. Everybody's Jewish. And, you know, probably a lot of Jews, if they listen, I think, what? They're, I thought they were all, like, Christians. They're Jewish. The, whole, the Holy Testament's Jewish. So, obviously, that would have got attention right right off the bat. Uh, did the person display a pleasing attitude? What do you think stood out about that guy? Comedic. What? Yeah, comedic. Yeah, Com comedic. Yeah. Okay, humor. Yeah, humor. He was definitely humorous, wasn't he? Yeah. Okay, what else do you think would... What... what how did he uh, attract you? How did he uh, come across to you? Other than just being humorous. The style of conversation definitely drew you in. It drew you in, didn't it? Yeah. Reasonable. Reasonable. I, I put a word I didn't put down here. Endearing. Mm -hmm. He's like a like a grandfather or an uncle yeah. or something. Just He just endears you, doesn't he? You know, he's the kind of person you like to kind of, you know, sit down and have a cup of coffee with. Um, did the person share their background? You know, he talks about the old radios and stuff. You know, mm -hmm. as soon as he starts talking about that, there's a, there's an age group that they're going to, I had one of those radios, you know. And, of course, he's just sharing his story, his background, but there's a lot of older people that would really connect with that and say, yeah, I remember that as well, and I was in the Boy Scouts and all that. Um, and, of course, uh, from a Jewish background, when the Jewish rabbi says, oh, that's a, that's a, that's a Gentile book, you know, don't be, don't be touching the, the New Testament. And there's probably every Jewish person who grew up in synagogue probably had that told to them. So a lot of those things they could certainly relate to. And then, of course, he was in the Navy, uh, people in the service in the Navy, going through getting your, uh, your your medical and picking up your stuff and, you know, Protestant, Catholic, Jewish, you know, to get what kind of Bible you were going to get. Um, now, how do you think a Catholic would react to that? It wasn't really good, was it, for a Catholic? <laughs> Now, the thing is, if you had a testimony toward Catholics, it would be different because they're making that with a, an audience in view. Okay? Now, why, why, and you'll see it in, in the next testimony as well, that they're really hard on the Catholics. Now, why is that? Why would that be? It's false religion. It's false religion. But from, again, from a Jewish standpoint, 
here's these people who grew up in New York and different places, and it was us and them. It was like a gang nearly. You know, it was the Jews had their people, and the Catholics had their people, and and so a lot of times Jews think, well, to be Christian, uh, you have got to lo- lose your Jewishness and you're going to become like the Catholics. And so he's trying to help them to understand that biblical Christianity is not what you've got with statues. Who, they had them in their lawns, you know. Um, so did they relate their, did he relate a salvation experience? And of course he did. He started with, you know, he was going through all, you know, sin in his life as a, a sailor. But he, he felt unclean. He felt dirty. And he's pointing out the need there. Um, did he give a time? What time? Uh? Three o'clock in the morning. In the morning. <laughs> it's two different times, or two different uh, statements that he made. There was three o'clock in the morning in the barracks. He puts the blanket over his head. And he just says, Jesus, I, I want to believe on you. And then he fell asleep. And you're thinking, what kind of testimony is that? But see, that's the thing about testimonies. It's not going to fit exactly what you think is going to be the, the, the perfect testimony. Um, but here's that's what happened. That's what happened in his life, you know. And that was his way of expressing faith in Christ. Because now obviously he had a lot of information coming up to that. And that was the breaking point. Um, and obviously you can see in his life afterwards that it was that it was real. And so he did relay his salvation experience. And... Uh, given May 16, 1961, 3 o'clock in the morning. Did he explain salvation? And if he did, what aspect did he emphasize? You know, he said to Jesus, you know, I want to believe in you. And then, and some of these testimonies, you'll find that they, they slip it in at the end. Okay, so what did he say at the end? It was really important, wasn't it? He says, if I was the only person in the world, Jesus would have died for me. And then he gave that assurance that, um, you know, when I die, I have confidence that I'm going to go uh, to be with him. Okay, and I'm giving you all the answers to this one, but we'll definitely be taking some answers back this way on the next one just to show you how we're going to do this, okay? Now, each story involved, as you'll see in when we get all three, someone who was a Christian witness. So who was the Christian witness to this guy? Yes. Navy sailor. Yeah. Navy sailor. And he says, is that your Bible? And obviously the, the Navy sailor was a Christian. and he was So he knows the guy's Jewish. He's got a Tanakh, the Old Testament. And where are you going to go to? Where could we go to? Genesis 22, Exodus chapter 12, Psalm 22, Isaiah 53. So this guy went to the best one, Isaiah 53. And he's thinking, this is, the, what do you do? This is Jesus? They, they give me the wrong book. <laughs> but what's Jesus doing in my Old Testament, you know? And see, that's, that's truth that's leading him down a path to uh, a salvation experience. Okay, uh, let's go to testimony number two then. This is a little bit longer. It's nine, nine, uh, nine minutes long, but this is a good testimony as well. They're all good, I think. I will never believe in Jesus. I was born a Jew. I will die a Jew. How can you expect me to believe in a God whose name my people have been killed? I don't care if it's true. I will never believe in Jesus. I grew up in a loving Jewish family. My mom and dad were very actively involved in the local synagogue and we were there pretty much every Friday or Saturday. We celebrated the holidays at Shul. We celebrated Passover at home. And my Jewish identity meant a lot to me growing up. I decided to go to college where I majored in fashion photography. And then after I worked in the photo industry for a couple of years, I decided to fulfill my lifelong passion of learning how to ski. I drove myself to Aspen, Colorado, where I knew no one, got a season pass, and started skiing. Aspen was heaven on earth, and that's where I wanted to live the rest of my life. And so it was there during my second ski season that I met a young woman from Kansas City, Missouri, perhaps the most curious person I've ever met in my life. In fact, she has a journalism degree from the University of Missouri she began talking to me about her faith in God. 
And she told me that she was a Christian. And I said, oh, that's nice, I'm Jewish. She kept asking me questions. Do you believe in God? Yeah, I believe in God. And she said, well, what's he like? Is he righteous and is he holy? What, what do you mean, what's he like? And I said, you know, he's other, you know, and we're here, we're down here, he's infinite, we're finite. She kept asking me questions and about God and about what I believed about God and, and why I believed it. And the more questions that she asked me, the more upset I would become with her. I would get angry with her. I'd get angry with her. How can you expect me to believe in a God whose name my people have been killed for 2,000 years? She, she appeared to me as being narrow-mindedly dogmatic. But it was over time, as she asked me questions about what I believed and why I believed it, it began to occur to me that maybe I was the one who was narrow-minded and dogmatic. I knew Jews don't believe in Jesus. I knew you can't be Jewish and believe in Jesus. But the more she pressed me to explain why those things were true, the more I realized I didn't know other than because. After she left, I decided, well, I'm going to start reading the Bible for myself to see what it says. And so, of course, I wouldn't go anywhere near the New Testament because I knew for a fact that the New Testament was Goyesha Bubamysis. It was Gentile grandmother stories. And everybody knew it was anti-Semitic, and so I would have nothing to do with that. What I discovered was that the God of this woman was my God was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That really touched me. It really, it really challenged me inside because it, it made me realize that I didn't know my own God, or at least I didn't know much about him. As I read more of the Bible, I began thinking more about my relationship with God. And I got to a point where I actually started to pray personally, you know, like talk to God. God, if Jesus is the Messiah and you want me to put my faith in him, then I'm willing to do that, but only if it's true, because if it's not true, the last thing I want to do now is to worship a man and be an idol worshiper. I began to really think about what it meant for me to become a believer in Jesus. You know, what would my parents think? And what would my brothers think? What would my aunts and my uncles and my cousins, what would 90% of my friends, at least my friends from New York think? It was like I was thinking about this and it was as if I heard a voice in my head say to me, Danny, that's right. The choice is between following me and everyone and everything else. If God is God, He's boss. You do what he says, and if there's a cost involved, it's worth it. This woman came back at the end of the summer, and she brought with her, when she came back, she brought with her a book that a friend of hers, her best friend, had given to her. And the title of the book, you ready for this? The title of the book was, What's a Nice Jewish Boy Like You Doing in the First Baptist Church? All of the questions I kind of had floating around in my head that I wasn't willing to ask directly were addressed in the book. Jesus was Jewish and the apostles were Jewish and all of the New Covenant, the New Testament books were written by Jews. To this point, I had never still opened the New Testament scriptures. But reading this book, I began to read them for myself for the first time. I grew up in a neighborhood that was mixed Jewish, mostly Jewish and a lot of Catholic kids. And so for me, Jesus and the New, Te New Testament was associated with those kids and the hatred that I got from them. And I was shocked to discover 
the exact opposite. I discovered a, a Jewish man addressing Jewish topics in a Jewish way who taught love for your enemies, love for all people, not the kind of hatred that I saw. And this Jesus who was the God of the Gentiles who hated the Jews began to evaporate because he didn't exist. I finished the book and she says to me, so what did you think of the book? I thought for a minute and I said, it was good, I liked it. I, I think it's gonna help me explain some things to my parents. And she, she, she was completely taken off guard. And she said, you mean you believe that Jesus is the promised Messiah of Israel? I said, yeah. She says, now you believe that he died on a Roman cross as a payment for your sin? And I said, yeah. And she said, and you believe that by trusting in him and what he did for you on that cross, your sins are forgiven and you have new life with God? And I said, yeah. You may be wondering about the identity of this very curious shiksa from Kansas City, this journalist who had such a profound impact on my life. And yes, what you are guessing is true. I chased her for another year and a half until she caught me. And we have been happily married for almost 39 years. After I had come to faith in Jesus, uh, it took me a few months to build the nerve to tell my parents about it because I knew it would be hard for them. My mother's response was just classic. Don't talk to me about Jesus. Don't tell me about him. I will never believe in Jesus. I was born a Jew. I will die a Jew. I don't care if it's true. I will never believe in Jesus. You gotta love God's tenacity with his people. Even as he sent someone into my life to tell me about Messiah, it was people who knew Messiah who helped my mother come to faith at the age of 86 years of age. And I had the most awesome, awesome privilege of leading my mom to faith in Messiah. Good, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, let's let's look at this one, uh, and let's think about the um, the first uh, the first question. Or how did the opening remarks capture attention? Now, what he actually what they actually did in the film was they went to that part where his mom was talking. I will never believe in Jesus, and I don't care if it's true. And you know, uh, now that that really that reflects really the heart and the position of many many Jewish people. So as soon as they hear their words coming back to them. It's kind of like, you know. So certainly, um, they, he tapped into very strong Jewish feelings there. And then, of course, as he starts his testimony, he identifies as Jewish. Uh, he uses some particular terms, Jewish terms, that I didn't know how to look them up. A, shik, a, a shiksa. Right? Anybody know what that is? Gentile girl. Gentile girl who's going after a Jewish boy. <laughs> So um, in this next one, uh, there's a, a term called uh, Kristallnacht. It's a German. It's, okay, it's German for the night of the breaking glass, right? And you'll see this next one. There's it's like the first sentence. There's three terms. There's it's three words. As soon as he says, it's like a Jewish person is like, you know. Okay, so did the person display a pleasing attitude? This guy here. And what stood out? What do you think? Defiant. Defiant. But his defiance was really <clears throat> on the side of the Jews being defiant, wasn't he? Yes. So what was he doing there? Right, he's identifying with them. He's putting himself in, in their shoes, right? He's, he's identifying himself with them. Because that's the only way 
because Jewish people, you know, probably maybe more than any other group of people, are really, really hard against this. So, and right at the beginning, you have to get their attention. Okay, so he's identifying himself. But what other, what other uh, ways would you think that this, that the attitude that he had? What, what did you feel about him? He was defiant. Yeah. What else? He was sincere, certainly. Huh? Humble, yeah. Um, I I felt there was something else there. And my word was reasonable. This guy's a reasonable guy. And not only that, you see, sometimes people look at Christians like we're, we're we're just dumb. You know, we're clinging to our guns and our Bibles, right? And we're we're kind of we're not all there. We're not right up there with the intelligentsia. And what a lot of times. Like in his testimony, this reasonableness came through. This intelligence came through. Okay, to, to do what he did, he was, and not only that, but when he talked about this lady that impacted his life, he said that she was a very curious person, uh, but she was a professional person. She had a journalist degree from the University of Missouri, right? Now, what does that tell you, right up? I mean, that's just instead of just saying this, this lady talked to me. You know, we don't know who the lady is, but he defines who this lady is by selling her up. And helping them to realize, you know, it's you know, all Christians are not stupid. You know, sometimes people think Christians are stupid. And here's a woman who is an intelligent person, who has a, a journalism degree, and she's asking questions. Okay, so I, I I felt he came across intelligent and very reasonable. He was he wasn't a nutcase. Okay. Number three, did the person share their background? Jewish background, and again, successful. Uh, number four, did they relate their sal- or did he relate his salvation experience? Now this is really good because he's telling the story about this lady who literally becomes his wife, and that's you know that comes down to question number seven: uh, who was the Christian witness in this story? Well, obviously it was this it was this lady. And how did she go about it? Asking questions. If I'm asking you questions, what do I have to do? I have to listen, right? If I'm doing all the talking all the time, first of all, you're not, you know, you're not receiving back feedback to to tweak the message, you know. But what this lady did, and you know, if she had to come in there like with, uh, you know, like a bull in the china shop with this guy, she wouldn't have got a look in. But she very patiently just asking questions. Well, what is your God like, you know? And got him, provoked him to think, and then he would have to answer her back. So it was a very good uh, way to do it on her part. Um, and of course, he started reading his Bible. Uh, what else was involved there beside the Bible? As far as tools that this lady treated in his hands. She gave him a book, right? What's a good, what's a nice Jewish boy like you doing in the first Baptist church? <laughs> I gotta look that one up. That's gonna be yeah. cute. Um, and see, this is the thing. I mean, this was this wasn't something that just happened on the doorstep. This is a this is a relationship. In fact, it was the second. I think it was the second season. And he met, you know. So this is a long period of time. You know, sometimes people are not just going to get saved like that. It takes time, especially people who are ingrained in other religions and so on. They've got to think. It's it's a journey that they're on. And a lot of times we can give them stuff to read. Now, obviously, you've got the Bible, uh, but then there's other things. So literature is important, not just gospel tracts, but there's, I mean, there's there's books out there. Like, you know, uh, you're going to see in the next one, the, the Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsay was a book that was used in this next lady's life. Um, in fact, a, a good friend of mine who was saved um who went to Tennessee Temple with me? That was that was what God used in his life. And in that book, he shows it's basically kind of like the anchors of faith, where they show he shows fulfilled prophecies. Um, in fact, my friend was telling me the prophecy about Tyre and Sidon. And you remember how that Nebuchadnezzar destroyed the walls, and then 200 and something years later, uh, Alexander the Great comes and he throws the stones into the sea and he builds the the causeway. You know, it's a tremendous uh, prophecy, and that really got his attention. You see. Okay, uh, now how did, this was, it was quite creative the way he got the gospel and did he explain salvation and how did he do that? Through the questions that she was asking. 
Because, okay. She, she asked him, what do you think of the book? And he says, and of course the, the key thing there was, it's going to help me to explain to my parents. And it's kind of like, what? What does that mean? It means that this guy has made a decision that he's going to have to talk to his parents about. And so then, so, but he uses that. And of course it probably happened just the way he said it. But then she was, but he was making the point to basically delineate the gospel, the plan of salvation. Does that mean that you believe that Jesus is the Messiah of Israel? Yes. Do you believe that he died upon the Roman cross? Yes. And he, and she, and he leads us through the plan of salvation. Pretty good. And of course, we can do the same thing because you can take at some point, you know, I could do it uh, by, by uh, the way I usually do it is when Wesley was witnessing me on top of the engine and he was giving me the gospel. So then I just give what the gospel is. I could also have sat that when I was sitting in church and sometimes I do that as well when Ed Bissett was preaching the gospel and uh, the, really the story about the second coming, I could go through those things. And so you're, you're, you're bringing the meat of the gospel to, to that individual. <laughs> Did the person emphasize contrast before salvation and after salvation? And what demonstrated that? What was the, the really the, the, the ice cream, the, the, you know, the cherry on the cake at the end? Let his mom. He let his mom to the Lord. I mean, so here he is, a Jewish person um, who didn't have any answers, and now he has led his mommy to the Lord at 86. Would you say there's a change in this guy's life? I mean, his life has completely changed. He's been married to this, this woman now for, what do you say, 39 years or something? And you can just tell, I mean, it just comes across, doesn't it? And his story and, and his, it's, it's just real. And I don't know who the guy is, but I, I believe him. It's interesting to contrast when you're saying that uh, the, the voice seemed to speak to him. Are you wanting to follow me? Mm hmm. Another great thing that I thought, and that was part of it, was when you're witnessing the person, okay, the person is coming up with all of these problems, all of these reasons why I can't get saved. So one of the problems is, you know, here's his whole, all of his friends. What's his friends going to think about it? How's he going to deal? You know, and some people say, well, that's okay, but if I got saved, what would my mommy think? What would my daddy think? What would my friends think? They saw his Jewish friends in New York. And what is he doing there? He's answering their questions in his testimony. He's anticipating these arguments that are coming up in their minds, and he's knocking them off one at a time. There was another one. It seemed to me, let me see. Yeah. Oh, um, the other thing was that the lady that talked to him, do you think that she had a rejection coming back at her? Some of the things that he said seemed like there was kind of like it was Barb coming back to her. And, you know, if she was touchy about it, she could just just walk away but she was patient maybe she was attracted to the guy anyway and uh, of course dating is not it's not recommended as a, as a, a way of evangelism okay because you, you can have problems there but anyway i'm sure they didn't really start dating until he got here but anyway um so he led his mom to the lord that was a real um contrast and then, of course, each story involves someone who was a Christian witness. This lady he met at Aspen became his wife, obviously. And what you're going to see, and we'll talk, we're going to show one more and finish it up, but all these people have somebody. And it's not just the Bible. The Bible is really important. It's not just gospel literature and anchors of faith and books that can be placed. And God can use that literature, but you, listen... There's always, there's always a person. And literature can maybe do like, you know, maybe 10%, but 90% is this personal contact with a Christian witness. You can't underestimate it. You just can't. And that's, that speaks volumes to me about the necessity, the just absolute necessity for us to connect with people and be looking for people to connect with. Right, we're going to show you this last one. Um... This is a lady, so can't leave the ladies out. My, my grandparents tried to get out of Germany since uh, Hitler came to power. Hitler. Kristallnacht came, and both of my grandfathers had to go into hiding. When the Nazis came to get my grandfather, 
my grandmother answered the door and said to them, why are you here? You've already taken him away. And they believed her. And so my grandfather was safe. Both my mother and my father's family left Germany on August 28, 1939. My parents were agnostics and we, we didn't talk about God, but we were very involved in synagogue life. I went to Hebrew school. I was a member of an Israeli dance troupe, president of my youth group. I went to Jewish summer camp. I never had a bat mitzvah because back in those days they weren't available for women yet. I fit in more with German Jews than I did with Americans. I went to Jewish summer camp every summer. It was called um, the Joseph Eisner Camp Institute for Living Judaism in the heart of the Berkshire Mountains. We sang uh, from the Psalms, I lift up my eyes to the mountains. From whence will my help come? My help comes from the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. And I remember singing that song, and I looked up into the sky and thinking to myself, God, what are you? Are you a force of, or are you a spirit? I don't know who you are. I had always had a dream when I was, since I was very little, of going to uh, Cornell University for college. And so my father told me, go into social work. That's what good Jewish women do. They go into social work. So my junior year, I started at Cornell. You know, the, the future was looming out ahead of me. And I had no idea what I was going to do with my life. I was really anxious about the future. I was really nervous. And I just started looking for answers. Why am I here? What's the purpose of my life? I started studying all kinds of religions, Buddhism, Hinduism, Confucianism, Zoroastrianism. I guess I just felt like the, the, the answers I was looking for, I hadn't found within Judaism, so I had to look outside. But what I found was they were so esoteric, they were so heavenly minded that they weren't of any earthly good. There was no way that I could really put them into practice in my life. While I was going through this search, one of my Jewish friends came to me and told me about this book that he had just read, The Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey. I finally went to the bookstore on campus and I got the book. I learned, first of all, reading this book, that Jesus was Jewish and that he was a direct descendant of King David. There were many prophets that spoke about the Messiah to come and this author was saying that Jesus was the one who fulfilled these prophecies. I prayed for the first time in my life. I prayed to God and I said to God, God, I don't know if, if this author is, if what this author is writing is true. Please show me the truth. I was in the library one day and happened to meet another uh, woman who was in one of my classes with me and sat down in the library and started talking. She was the most loving, kind, patient, understanding person I ever met. Within the space of a few weeks, this woman that I had just met became the best friend that I ever had. We went to lunch and a woman sat down with us at lunch. And we talked, and then this woman turned to me and she said to me, do you know Jesus? Is he your Messiah? I looked at her and I looked at my friend, and my friend had this expression on her face that said to me that she was agreeing with what this woman was saying. And I looked at my friend and I, and I was about to start screaming and yelling at her. How can you believe in that stuff? That's all malarkey. It's all fairy tales. It's all nonsense. And then all of a sudden, I heard a still small voice. And the voice said, listen to her. She loves you. She's your best friend. <laughs> and so I, I listened to her. And she told me her story.
because of the love that I experienced from this woman, I, I just knew that what she was talking about was the truth. And so at that luncheon table with hundreds of people around us, I just prayed a very simple prayer. And um, I invited Jesus to come into my life. All of my fears about the future just completely vanished. I was just filled with it. It was like I was enveloped in a cloud of peace. It was like there was this dome of peace that just came over me. I was a member of the Cornell Choir, and we had been scheduled to sing the night when I accepted Jesus as my Messiah. And the concert that we gave was Handel's Messiah. So I got to stand on that platform singing Handel's Messiah that night for the first time understanding what Isaiah was talking about. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. That was Yeshua, that was, the, that was Jesus, that was the Messiah. I just recognized him, I just came to know him. And so the words became alive in my mouth. I was looking for purpose and meaning in my life. Why was I created? What was the purpose of life? Why was I here? And through Jesus, God answered all those questions for me. I realized that I was created to have a relationship with God and that God loves me and he wants to be in a relationship with me. And he wants that relationship to go on forever and ever and ever. All right. Okay. Well, her opening remarks, again, uh, Jewish in context, and those words when she said, grandparents, Germany, Hitler, Kristallnacht, all those words are just like, in the Jewish heart and mind, just that's, you know, they're, they've got their attention, Nazis. Um, did this person display a pleasing attitude? What, what struck you about this particular testimony? Mm -hmm. and and that's that's true but as far as her giving her testimony which was actually given her testimony what was it that, that came across to you that, that maybe touched your heart or connected with you uh-huh uh, personable, personable. Yeah. she was sincere. sincere okay um and of course there's another uh, word really emotional yeah. you know and you know, if you, I don't, you know, I don't see anybody's crying or eyes, but uh, yeah, I mean, I watched this at the house and I was weeping a little bit because, and there's something about that when a Christian, because you have that same thing in the side of, same side of you and you meet somebody who, yeah. this person completely, we've never met before, different background, different, and that's the thing about all these people, the only connection they have is that they're Jews and now they're Christians, now they're saved, you know, um, one was saved 1960, here's one, you know. Um, the truth of the gospel can reach into really any heart and, and change that heart. But anyway, there's emotion there. Did the person share their background? Yeah. Um, so she told a little bit herself and how she, you know, it starts out in the home. Well, uh, her family was agnostic and they didn't really talk about God. Um, and then she had these questions. Okay, she's on a search and again, they interject this Cornell University. Again, somebody who's professional, somebody who's intelligent in the library. Uh, but searching, what were the, what are the questions? What are some of the questions that Why people ask? Why am I here? How did I get here? Where am I going? And those are those are real questions that everybody asks. And of course, that connects when people are hearing that testimony. Uh, did they relate their salvation experience? Now hers was a little, a little different, a little strange, and that's the thing about it. Each one of these stories are different, and that's the, you know we we've spoken about that when when you hear a testimony just because you know you're not trying to get you're not trying to duplicate the the testimony or the the the, the experience. You're trying to help that person to come to believe upon Christ, and they're they're going to have their own story. You know, and this lady has her own story and she, she expressed it in a, a different way maybe than the other two. But what really comes across here, of course, she gets the book um, by Hal Lindsay. Um, but when she relayed it 
related her salvation experience. She said that um, it really revolved around that, that around the table at lunch. Now she didn't go in and explain all that happened there, but here she's, and then she met this this, uh, this this lady who was very kind and compassionate and showed love and understanding and patience. And so this was the Christian witness, obviously, uh, was a great impact. And, and, and what you see there is the person, this lady was one to this person before she was one to the Lord. And, and she said because she knew this person, over the, even though it was just a short period of weeks, she, she, she just sensed that love. And, and, and the lady had credibility. She knew what this woman is saying is true because I can see it in her life. But what happened at lunch was she's sitting down with this, this lady. And then this other lady comes in. And I don't know if the first lady knew the second lady, if it was prearranged, but this was an ambush, <laughs> if not prearranged. This was a soul-winning situation. And this other woman that came in was basically laying it right out, out on, on the table, and there was the possibility for fireworks here, but um, what actually happened was the lady got saved at the table. The, this, this other lady led her to the Lord. And uh, so it, it happened that, you know, she's, I'm, you know, filling in the, the gaps there. But that's what happened at lunch. This is when this lady uh, got saved right there. She asked the Lord to save her. Now, did she explain salvation? Uh, and this one, she didn't go through the mechanics of the gospel as far as the substitutionary death of Christ. But um, but she, she talked about inviting Christ, about just receiving the Lord and ask the Lord into her life, ask the Lord to see her, that critical point, uh, that it was an event, that it took place in a moment. Uh, did the person emphasize contrast before salvation and after salvation, even that very day? And, you know, if you've ever sat through Handel's Messiah, what does it take, about three hours or something? I would have that contrast there, fear and fearless. Yeah. She had peace. Now, now here's the thing. We would hear that, and she said, I heard this voice, the small, still voice, which is actually a Bible verse. But, and then, of course, they had to, to make, make it dramatic with these, you know, the background, like, whispers, and that's, you know, crazy. But what happened there was the Holy Spirit was speaking to her heart and saying, listen, listen to this lady. Listen to her. But when she got saved, then, you know, her, she said all her, all her fears went and peace surrounded her. She got the answers to her questions. And then, of course, that wonderful standing up to sing Handel's Messiah, you know, for unto us a child is, oh, you know, I'm not going to try to sing it to you, but, <laughs> and the Hallelujah Chorus, and it's out of Isaiah and Revelation. Um, it's tremendous. And if she sang that, man, that every, and it's, you know, it's all scripture. It's all scripture. And that would certainly have made a real impact in her, in her uh, life that, that day. So, um, she said it came alive in her mouth. The scriptures came alive in her mouth. Mm. Tremendous, great story, great testimony. Um, and who was the person in this story? Well, it was this Jewish friend that gave her the book, first of all. I don't even know if he was saved, but I don't know. He's, he's reading the Christian book. And then, of course, this lady and this witnessing event that took place between the other two ladies. So somehow a Christian was involved there. It wasn't just that she read a, a book or she read some gospel literature. Somebody was there witnessing to her, loving her, helping her, being patient with her, and leading her uh, to, to the Lord. Okay, so we're, we're, we're finished now. Um, let me see. You know, Paul said, to the Jews, I became as a Jew. To those that were under the law, I became as one who was under law. To those who were without law, I became as one who was without law. Uh, I made all things to all men that I by all means may win, may win some. And that's what we see here in these testimonies. They're Jewish people reaching back to their Jewish community, trying to get them to see the same light that they saw. So um, I think it was worthwhile, don't you? Uh, the testimonies themselves were good. But if you just think, and by the way, those are all on Facebook or it's on the uh, uh, one for Israel. Just Google that, and you'll, there's whole, there's 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 lots of testimonies there, um, and it's good just to listen to those stories sometimes, you know. But as we close, how can you take what we have learned tonight and put it into your testimony, you know? 
uh, you may take this, you know, put number four on there and say, okay, here's my testimony. And how would you go about giving your testimony? Would you, could you hit all, all seven of these things? And because uh, uh, a lot of times we have given our, 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 our testimony over and over and over again, but we haven't really thought about what's the necessary things to highlight. Okay. And so some things are just superfluous. They're not really that important, but there's other things that happened in your story that people need to hear. Okay. And what I'm saying is, is also this, that there's people, as I said before, that, um, that you can relate to, that nobody else can relate. There's people just like you. There's people in your community and in your uh, circle of friends and family and relatives and neighbors and so on who are, are just like who you were and you can relate to them. And there's other people who are not, but, but God can use your testimony as he's used these people's testimony. Uh, to reach somebody but if we're saved we all have that story we all have a testimony and it's one of the most powerful tools that god has given to us uh, to be able to speak to somebody because you're telling somebody your story what happened to you and that's what a witness is simply telling what you know and that's what happened to them and that's what happened to us too let's pray together lord thank you for this time together tonight it's been a little different but lord we're so thankful for your working in these people's lives and it just refreshes our um <laughs> Our knowledge that Lord you're always at work in many people's lives uh, people we don't know um, all around the world you're at work and you use believers to speak to the unbelievers uh, to win them to yourself and Lord we thank you for these Jewish people uh, Lord we remember the words of Paul my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved and Lord help us to have a heart for the Jewish people but Lord for all people uh, and help us to be willing to be that person that will connect with somebody and help us, Lord, to be patient, maybe to ask them questions or to tell them uh, our story, to present the gospel to them. Help us, Lord, to be a witness and a testimony. Empower us, Lord. Fill us with your spirit and use us, Lord. And, Lord, I know that you would use us if we'd just be willing to be used, if we'd just step out and step up and open our mouths and make the connection. And turn the conversation towards spiritual things. If we would do it, Lord, I know that you would use it. So, Lord, help us to do these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.